Good morning, it's still morning. Um, so I tend to start my presentations with uh, voices, voices from young people. I work a lot with children and young people. Um, I'm a criminologist at Middlesex University. Uh, where I engage with young people to understand what they do online, their attitude, their behaviour, their experiences. And I was commissioned um, by the NSPCC and the Children's Commissioner, the NSPCC is a very large uh, UK charity, to carry out a research to learn about uh, the impact that online pornography has on children and young people. I hope I'm clear enough. Um, so I wasn't sure it was normal to watch it. This was uh, one of the quotes that more than a thousand children um, gave us. Um, and I'm always very keen to, to use their voices when I present. Um, Forward, yes. So I work uh, for the Centre for Abuse and Trauma Study at Middlesex University where we carry out research on the online sphere. Um, and online pornography is one of those topics that we've studied, examined, um, and we are still currently talking about uh, because, as we know, it is a very important issue. We learnt that children go online to watch pornography. Um, and it's normal, I suppose. Um, we are, um, you know, that age, I can, I'm looking around, uh, I'm not trying to judge your ages, but I'm sure that we all know what pornography is, right? We have no doubt about what is a co pornographic content. However, I'd like to say, <clears throat> the pornography I've seen is very different, some of it anyway, from the pornography that some of our children are exposed to when they're online. And I've learned a great deal of material that they watch and they're exposed to uh, when they're online. And some of the material that I learned uh, was quite shocking and very different from what I have seen or you might have seen. So let me tell you a little bit about the research that we carried out. Um, first of all, it was a national study uh, in the UK uh, where we engaged with over a thousand young people and we asked them about their experiences. Well, first of all, the first question was, have you seen pornography and what is pornography to you and for you? We carried out this research in three stages. Uh, the first one was an online uh, forum where we invited young people to speak to us anonymously. And it was very successful because imagine talking about pornography, it's difficult for us, uh, it's difficult for them to admit that this is what they do. Um, so to offer young people an anom anonymous online platform to share with us their experiences was methodologically incredibly successful. Once we did this online uh, discussion with them, we then developed a survey which was distributed all across the kingdom. Um, we reached out, as I said, to uh, more than a thousand children. And again, that was a huge challenge. And I probably don't need to tell you why. It was very hard to enter schools. It was very hard to say, to gain permission to ask children to talk about their experiences with online pornography. People don't like talking about it. And some schools shut the doors to us. Uh, because they don't think that their children are exposed to or are watching pornography. They don't think it's healthy to talk about pornography because otherwise you can ingrain into their brain the desire to watch pornography. So it was tough. It was a tough project. It was hard to get in. It was hard to engage with young people. Uh, although they loved 
talking to us once we got to speak to them about their experiences of online porn, and they wanted to tell us more. So let me tell you a little bit methodologically what we did. I was in an online platform where we were chatting via text. Children don't like to speak to, you know, a lady that does criminological research. They prefer typing. And let me tell you, I struggled to keep up with their typing. They were so fast, there was so much they wanted to tell us about their use, their experiences, and their desire to watch more or to continue to watch it. Once we carried out the survey, this was stage two, the final stage was to, of course, analyze the data and go back to these children and check with them if what we learned was correct and what more could we get from them. So before we started this research, there were a few things that we were 100% sure about. We were 100% sure through review of the literature and other studies that have been carried out across the globe that a substantial proportion of children and young people are exposed to or access pornography. This is a crude reality, but young people do watch pornography all the time, sometimes repetitively in a day. Children and young people Exposure and access to pornography occur both online and offline. Of course, the offline word now, you know, you, you wouldn't find anyone going to a news agent to buy a magazine like we probably did. Now they just have to click away. And uh, uh, the lovely presentation that we had uh, the first day, if you type in, as we learned, sex, you know, the word is your oyster. Exposure and access to pornography increases with age. The older the child, the more likely children are to be exposed to pornography and to view pornography. And their desire and curiosity and interest develops as they develop sexually. Exposure is more prevalent than deliberate access. What do we mean? That a lot of the children that we also engaged with they don't look for it. They happen to see it. We've seen now that, you know, WhatsApp is the most popular uh, app. So through WhatsApp, you know, you may be on the bus and you have a mate that gets an image and here you are, you're exposed to it. And imagine for a nine, ten years old that doesn't even know what sex is, being exposed to an image that it's very, very uh, crude, should I say. Exposure to sexualized and violent imageries affect children and young people. Well, we've had a number of presentations this morning that reinforce this statement. Access and exposure to pornography affect children and young people's sexual beliefs. What we see in pornography uh, and what some children see in pornography is what they think they should be copying and doing. A lot of the young people that we spoke to are frustrated, scared, terrified of sex because they believe that what they've seen in pornography is the real sexual image of two people engaging in sexual relationships. So you can imagine how it may affect them and their healthy sexual relationships in the future. Access and exposure to pornography are linked to children and young people's engagement in risky behavior. Well, again, we learned today, you know, the more violence children are exposed to, the more sexualized behavior, the more they tend to be influenced by it. So this is what we were very confident about before we started the research. We weren't so confident about children's attitudes, behavior towards pornography once they view it. And the changes between viewing it and with time, how, you know, if the time of watching pornography is prolonged, how does this change with time? So we weren't sure about this. We were sure about the risks, and we were sure about what it is in the United Kingdom at the moment, dominating the headlines. 
you know, children in school, caught sexting, caught watching pornography, um, children copying um, pornographic images in many ways and uh, sharing their own images around and therefore producing, in a way, indecent images of children, which is highly illegal, as you know. And of course, we're not here to criminalize children. We're here to help them to be aware that what they produce, it's illegal content. We also know that the sex education in school, it's still not up there. And we definitely need to improve that. And pornography, it's certainly a subject that needs to be mentioned. So, I'm sure that our definition of pornography is slightly different from those that children might be. So what we did, we developed a definition that we then shared with the children and young people to gain their approval, also to make sure that we all started the research on the same level. So it was defined uh, by us and with the help of young people as images and films of people having sex or behaving sexually online. This includes semi-naked and naked images and films of people that you may have viewed or downloaded from the internet or that someone else shared with you directly or showed to you on their phone or computer. To us, this was very important because a lot of kids are exposed to pornography and they don't think they're actually viewing it because someone else is making them to watch it. So we wanted to include that element. So these are our definitions. In our research, we, of course, included all children as defined by law under the age of 18. Um, for access, we meant deliberate access or accidental access. Um, exposure was non-deliberate, of course. And when we talked about the effects, we were keen to ensure that we were capturing the impact and influences of pornography and the association between pornography and outcomes, steps and consequences. So what did we find? We found that in our whole sample, um, the Almost 50-50 here, you can see 52% of our respondents between the age of 11 and 16 had not seen pornography. And 48% uh, of the same group um, had seen pornography. Now, I'm not sure what you think, if that's a high percentage or not. Um, can I have, do you think it's a high percentage? Were you expecting? We always have to add an element of optimism, don't we? <laughs> yes, I think I agree with that. Uh, we also have to think, you know, when you carry out research, some children may, and there's always that kind of limitation in research, you know, not everybody is truthful. But if this is the real truth, then we could expect that this uh, percentage is slightly higher for those children that have seen pornography, okay? Now, I'm expecting a question here. Why did you sample children between the age 11 to 16 and not younger? Well, I would have liked to, but I wasn't allowed for ethical reasons before you asked that question. And I think actually more work needs to be done with younger children um, because I think Younger children being exposed to pornography can have an even higher detrimental effect of their mental well-being. Of those young people that have seen porn, uh, 148 told us that uh, they did it on my own. Um, it popped up. And then, as you can see, the, the numbers between they searched for it on their own, uh, they were shown by someone else, it's very, very similar. So you can see that children are either similarly searching for it or exposed to it. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's a lot of kids that are not looking to see it. And there's a lot of kids that when they're exposed, they may react 
in a ne very negative way. And bear in mind, we do know that children, and you know, we've been there, we've been young, and we do know that children do search for pornography because they're curious, because they want to learn more, right? They want to see. And I don't have a problem with that. I have an issue with those children who are not looking for it, who are not ready to see it, but they're exposed to it. And these are the children, I think, that we <clears throat> are most concerned with. Now, in viewing pornography, there's also a very big difference between how boys react and how girls react. So these are the differences. Boys, as you would expect, feel more positive about online pornography. And they're less likely to see online porn as exploitative, degrading, or humiliating. Surprise, surprise. Girls, on the other hand, feel more negative about online porn. They're worried about how boys who have seen porn will see girls and how they would expect girls to behave sexually. There's a lot of expectations from boys with girls when they're engaging in sexual relationships. They want girls to behave in certain ways. They want them to be, to looking, to be looking in certain ways, to be shaved in a certain ways. And this is all expectation that often comes from what they see online. Also another uh, not so surprising statistic is the fact that boys, 56% of our, of our group have seen pornography, 56% were boys and 40% were girls. Now, I think it's also important to look at the age difference. And you see, as I mentioned at the beginning, that the older children are, the more they are exposed to or they're looking for online pornography. So you can see here that a smaller proportion, thankfully, of 11 to 12 year olds, 28% uh, have seen pornography. Now to me, this is still, however, rather concerning. Because an 11-year-old, I mean, your teachers, you're exposed to children, are still very little <laughs> to see what is available online. And my major concern is that what they see online is not often controllable, meaning that there are some elements of pornography that it's, I wouldn't call it extreme because it's illegal, but it's really horrendous. And some of the terminology that I learned from these young people shocked me, let alone these young kids. You can expect that the 15, 16 years old are starting to become uh, more sexualized and more active, and therefore they, they're using pornography, they're viewing pornography. We asked them as well about, you know, of course you've seen pornography, but how do you feel? And you can see below here that 21% of those that have seen porn want to copy it. They want to copy what they have seen online. And this is of the smallest group, the youngest group. And of course the percentage increases as you move up in the scale of age. We asked another question which I think was quite important. How do you feel when you see pornography? Very tough question to ask. Luckily, it was all done anonymously, and the kids felt quite comfortable, I believe, to tell us how they felt. So, as you would expect, the reaction during the first viewing of pornography was curiosity. Shocked was the second highest response. Confused, disgusted, nervous. We had so many more adjectives to add here. Interestingly, the more they were exposed to pornography, the curiosity decreased, and then you can see at the very end, they felt more turned on as they were repeatedly viewing pornography after the first time. And I think this is a, a very interesting point, very interesting how, how they become more accustomed to what they see that kind of visual imagery that shocked them in the beginning, then 
was transformed into pleasure after repeated viewing of the same material. We asked the question as well, you know, how, you know, what are the other feelings that you had? And most uh, children, uh, age 13 to 16, told us most of the pornography that I've seen was, as you can see, unrealistic, shocking, silly, arousing, all sorts of responses we have here. I also too wanted to, sorry, this, this slide is very dense, but I wanted to bring some voices of young people, just to see as well, you know, the difference between boys and girls and see what they say and how they feel. You know, what do, you, what do they say about seeing pornography? Well, they've seen it as a joke with friends, says a boy, yes, we all do it, so why not doing it ourselves? It is around and, uh, and so on and so forth. Girls, I never personally searched for it. Young people are curious about sex and they're probably influenced by older people to view it. So we can see here that there's, you know, we don't necessarily search for it, but we're, we're curious and everybody's watching it, so I want to watch it too. So there's a lot of peer pressure, but this is not surprising, is it? What we were concerned as well was, you know, how do you copy it? So sexting was certainly one of the subjects that came up. And what was interesting, some of the young people told us that sexting is not about imageries. So sending a provocative, sexy, nude photo of oneself, it's not sexting. Sexting is about texting, talking about sex. So that also concerned us. So the definition of sexting is not clear in young people's heads which perhaps, again, we need to make very clear in our campaigns, in our discussions with young people. We asked about, you know, how, how did you share your photo? And what A lot of young people did not really want to answer this question because, of course, here we're talking about threats. But of those that shared those information with us, we found that, um, they took images of themselves performing a sexual act to an online contact and shared it with others. And of those who did, 2.5% had sent a picture of themselves performing a sexual act. So again, the numbers here are low because a lot of young people didn't respond, uh, but there's more work to be done on that statement. Young people, as we've seen this morning, those shop, shocking videos, young people share a lot of themselves and sometimes inappropriate content. So sharing of young people who had taken se uh, naked selfies, 55% said that they did with someone that they didn't know. And it was a kind of online uh, friend, an online person that they met. Boys share naked selfies more than girls. Surprise, surprise. But more girls share naked selfies after being asked to send them. So a lot of boys expose themselves because they feel more virile. Girls are more persuaded to send images of themselves, and they do when they're asked. More boys sent naked selfies to other people without being asked, interestingly. So I am sharing this information with you, uh, not to shock you, uh, but to give you some messages and to share with you some of, you know, some of the recommendations that came out from this research and what young people have asked us to share with you. Information. Most young people want advice on sexual health and relationship, not just the biology of sex. They want to learn more. Sex is very interesting. Kids are interested about sex. And a lot of those people that we spoke to, they felt that because they didn't have enough, they were looking to learn more through pornography, sadly. School. Most young people sought more relevant relationships and sex education in school that would include discussion about the effects 
of pornography, it is a tough subject to discuss because, you know, how do you talk about it without showing a bit of it? But it can be done. Not to prevent young people from seeing it, because we can't do that, but to prepare them that what they see, it's not normal and it's not healthy. To understand that that is not normal to engage sexually like what they've seen online. Parents, some young people think it's good to talk with parents, especially when something is upsetting them. But again, it's an awkward subject to approach and a lot of parents don't want to talk about it because they don't know how. Young people have asked us to, uh, to place some age verification on websites because a lot of the material that they're exposed to, it's just accidental, they, want, they don't want to see it. Why should I see it if I didn't ask for it? And I agree with that. And funnily enough, in the UK, we are trying to implement that. Don't ask me how. It's been going on since the publication of this study, and uh, they still haven't managed to succeed through the Age Verification, uh, the, the Digital Economy Act, the age verification. Um, they want more online help as well. You know, if, if something troubles me, what, who can I talk to? Someone anonymous, like they've talked to me so openly, so beautifully. And they want to include everyone. They want to include young people as well in this kind of advice. Young people that have seen pornography, pornography young people that feel that they've been affected negatively about pornography. Um, so, just to summarize, uh, education is certainly there, up there. They want it to be included, and I think it's important in a conference like this to ensure that we remember these kind of points. You know, we take them home with us and we try to think and implement them. Open discussions on online pornography in all schools, uh, religious and secular schools as well. We have a lot of religious private schools in England where, you know, they will never approach these type of subjects, and these kids are ill-prepared because they will go eventually online. Um, they want those messages to be delivered professionally by specialists, not by their teachers that, you know, they teach, not an English teacher or a math teacher or a Latin teacher. They want professional people to enter and that know how to approach these subjects. Um, and they're definitely in favor of the age verification. So this is just a summary of uh, the recommendations. So foster safe online secure engagement, provide specialist training, uh, co-create learning with young people, acknowledge how they use the language appropriately, particularly around the sexting element. Um, I've got some more here. I'm happy to share these slides, of course, uh, information if you wish to, to read more about the study and to read more about how to engage in a healthy way with young people and talk about the subject of pornography. Thank you very much.